Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to welcome you all to this Friday seminar on Brexit and the future of European and Norwegian security. Before we begin, let me just inform you that this seminar will be streamed, so it's going to be available online both as we speak and later. Um, these last years, there have been quite a few workshops, I would say, and conferences and seminars here in Oslo discussing the causes and consequences of Brexit. And many of them have taken place here at NUPI. And I have sometimes wondered if we're running the risk of some sort of Brexit fatigue. Um, at some point, maybe we will just get tired and start discussing other matters instead. But as this, this quite full room shows, we're nowhere uh, there yet. Uh, there is no sign of that happening. Uh, the negotiations between Britain and the EU are still ongoing. And every week, at least my inbox and Twitter feed is filling up with new analysis of the Brexit situation. So what is Britain's future relations with Europe and the EU going to look like? And one of the policy areas where there's most uncertainty at the moment is the field of security cooperation. Britain has, as you know, been a key player in the development of a framework for security and defence cooperation within the EU. It has about one-fifth of the EU's military capabilities, and it is one of the very few NATO members which currently meets its 2% goal. And while some of the EU's member states now move towards deeper defence and security cooperation with PESCO as one of the major uh, milestones these days, Britain's future role is uncertain. So will Britain use its military leverage to force concessions in the ongoing negotiations? How will Brexit affect security cooperation in Europe? How will it impact on the dynamics between EU members and non-members and between the EU and NATO at the more institutional level? And of course, since we are here in Norway today, we are particularly interested in what this means for Norwegian security and defence policy. We have three excellent speech speakers with us here today. We have Stephen Blockmans, we have Garval Walsh, and we have Øystein Bø. I will introduce them in more detail as we go along, but I, and I will also open up for questions yeah. after the discussion. So our first speaker here today is Stephen Blockmans, who has been a guest here at NUPI many times before. Um, Stephen is a senior research fellow and head of EU foreign policy uni unit at the Center for European Policy Studies in Brussels. He is also a part-time professor of EU external relations, law and governance at the University of Amsterdam. His academic anchoring is in international law. And today he will speak about how Brexit influences the CSDP, the EU's common security and defence policy. So Stephen, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kristen. And thank you so much to, to NUPI and to all of you to come, uh, to come out for this uh, lunchtime lecture. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be back. Um, what I would like to do is, is maybe, since I'm the first speaker, uh, to quickly canvas the, the, the accelerated development of the CSDP before discussing what the current and potential impact of Brexit may be on um, European security and defense cooperation and integration uh, within the European Union. Um, as we know, CSDP has uh, seen a rapid uh, evolution in the last uh, two years, mainly as a result of what Carl Bildt calls the PBT factor, the Putin-Brexit-Trump factor, to which one could possibly add terrorism, refugee, migration, and all other crises that have afflicted the, Europe, the European Union and, uh, and, uh, and borderlands. Um, but Brexit, of course, has been one of the defining moments in, the, in that accelerated drive towards further um, uh, security and defence cooperation within the European Union. In fact, we've seen um, uh, two days after uh, the UK referendum, um, the EU sign off, at least in, a, in the form of a presentation, on um, a strategic reori reorientation uh, process with the um, with the presentation, as I mentioned, of the European Global uh, Strategy, the most concrete part of which deals with uh, security and uh, defence cooperation and uh, integration. 
Now, on the back of Brexit, the UK referendum, we've seen quick steps being, uh, being taken. The EU at 28, therefore including the, uh, the UK, took the decision already after the summer at Bratislava uh, to create uh, a military headquarters within the European External Action Service, or in EU speak, the MPCC. And, uh, I, won't, I won't bore you with too many acronyms, I hope, but uh, there will be some alphabet soup, I'm afraid, uh, served to you for lunch. Um, we've seen, of course, the European Commission advance uh, work on the European Defence Action Plan uh, since then, with the launch uh, specifically of a European Defence Fund, um, which opens up a, a research and, and a capability development window in the area of uh, defence, with some limited money available until the end of this uh, multi-annual financial framework, and the promise of 1.5 billion euro annually uh, for uh, the continuation of, uh, of that fund if and when budget negotiations uh, taken into account the, uh, the withdrawal of the second biggest contributor to the general budget uh, come to fruition with after 2020 half a billion euro annually being spent on, um, on uh, research and a billion <coughs> on capability uh, development. So EDF, not to be confused with the European Defen uh, Development Fund, of course, but the European Defence Fund coming online, and a supervisory system um, which ought to bring more transparency in member states' defence budgeting, planning, uh, under a so-called CARD, or uh, Coordinated Annual Review for uh, Defence, See it as a kind of semester system, uh, as we know it from the Eurozone, voluntary in basis in principle, very light uh, uh, regulatory uh, framework, or rather built on peer pressure than uh, legal enforcement mechanisms. And then finally, in December of 2017, um, we've seen the Council adopt a decision formally launching PESCO, it was already mentioned, the Permanent Structured Cooperation, in the area of security and defense, with 25 of the 28 member states. Britain not participating, Malta, which has but a small Coast Guard, not participating, and Denmark, which has a permanent opt-out of CSDP, not participating either. So if anything, I think the sub-conclusion to the seminar could be that the impact of Brexit uh, has been to spur the rapid development of uh, defense and cooperate, defense cooperation and integration in the European Union, whereas this was traditionally stunted by um, notably the British government, but not only um, when the EU, when the, the UK was uh, perceived itself as a full-fledged member of uh, of the EU. It still is formally, of course, but we've seen it uh, adopt a more um, constructive attitude uh, on structural. Um, uh, integration efforts within the EU since the UK referendum. So we're now at a stage where the European Defence Agency, um, as Secretariat of PESCO, uh, supervises the implementation of 17 uh, research and development projects which are co-financed to the amount of 20 to 30 percent of each project from EU general budgetary means, and soon there will be more projects um, floated. Uh, projects include uh, the creation of a medical command, uh, cyber coordination platform, uh, cyber emergency response teams, uh, and even a new infantry fighting uh, vehicle. Um, and some have criticized these projects for their limited uh, scope, uh, perceived inability to plug strategic uh, shortfalls in the in the area of uh, of defense also the voluntary nature of uh, of pesco itself lacking as i mentioned a legal backstop uh, to to enforce commitments political commitments uh, but most have welcomed these baby steps in uh, in capability development and the groundwork uh, to create an, an eu framework to beef up csdp both in an operational sense, when these capabilities will be, in fact, used by 
battle groups which ought to be mobilized uh, for now, or in the future rather, um, and underpinned by a defense industrial base which ought to gradually grow um, on the basis of these capability development programs. So PESCO here is, is to be seen primarily in, uh, in the latter sense, defense industrial base, and its future uh, operationalization in, uh, well, standby force packages of a number of uh, member states. And um, the, the proponents of this whole system, of course, stress also that the peer pressure that it puts on participating member states to actually spend more on defense, more towards the 2% goal which they've agreed to um, at the Wales summit within, uh, within NATO, as well as 20% uh, on equipment uh, development and, and 18 other commitments, uh, political commitments entered into. Both the criticism and the and, and, and the propositions for and the support for uh, for PESCO does show, uh, I think, the tension that exists also between member states. Their drive, on the one hand, German-led drive for inclusivity, uh, with as many member states participating in what, in legal terms, is a differentiated form of integration, um, and the French ambition uh, to to increase the level of ambition, uh, to have perhaps a smaller group going much further and creating a sort of military capability at, uh, at EU level. So that tension is clearly, uh, clearly visible. And in fact, uh, on the French side, um, one could even say that um, with the operationalization of PESCO, it has already been undercut by Macron's own um, suggestion in his Sorbonne speech that there should be a sort of European uh, intervention initiative outside of the EU and NATO frameworks, kind of very flexible ad hoc um, mechanism for those uh, states able and willing to engage in expeditionary warfare of the kinds that France has done primarily unilaterally um, in, in, the, in, in the past. So far, the, the quick canvas, if you want, uh, we can discuss um, uh, elements of that if you wish. But I, I would like to turn to the impact of Brexit on uh, on this development, which I said, you know, has already been beneficial in a, in a sense of, of spurring at least the EU 25 uh, into the area of PESCO. Let me go out on a limb here and, um, and, and say that um, there will be more collaboration between the EU and the UK in the field of defense in the future than there has been uh, when the UK was a, a full-fledged member of the European Union. Sure, there are minor nuances which you can attach to that, intelligence, cooperation, you know, whatever uh, benefits there may have been for uh, other EU member states to, um, to get information through the Brits um, from the Five Eyes um, cooperative framework, which is arguably the, uh, the highest level in, uh, in the world. Um, but I think overall the, the, the effect will be positive. Um, and there's a couple of reasons to, to, to believe so, and I'll come to them. But I think the key question, however, is how, how meaningful that uh, future collaborative framework in security and defense is going to be in a strategic sense. Uh, will it go beyond the ad hoc tokenistic type of cooperation, uh, the cherry picking, picking and mixing, um, approaches that the UK stands accused of uh, by especially the European Commission in, a, in other fields of future cooperation. Um, here, I think, um, just as a backdrop, there are four factors that will define um, such, such a drive to either more strategic, comprehensive uh, cooperation or more ad hoc fragmented. Uh, one certainly will be uh, determined by the by the domestic politics of within the UK and uh, and the EU. The second would be the changing global political environment, uh, putting pressure on on either side basically to to cooperate uh, or to seek refuge in other types of bilateral or multilateral uh, cooperative frameworks. Third factor would be the evolution of the overall Brexit negotiations. Um, and the nature of the future relationship between the EU and, uh, and the UK. 
And a fourth would be the specific nature of CSDP itself, um, as opposed to other EU external relations areas. <coughs> I would like to touch upon the first and the fourth uh, of these factors, because the global political um, constellation um, we, we know, and uh, in fact we know more about, uh, about it um, uh, uh, with, an, with an emphasis on Russia, and um, the evolution of the overall Brexit negotiations, well, uh, we, we can all imagine more or less what, uh, what that entails. But the domestic, political, and UK, um, UK and EU um, well, politics um, are, are, are something to take into account as far as CSDP and uh, security and defense cooperation in the, in the wider sphere is concerned. What do we know there? Uh, what do we know about um, what the UK wants, what the EU position is, and, and when we may get some indication on how this will all be playing out. On the UK side, I think we have a bit more clarity as to what the UK itself thinks it uh, might be able to bring to the table and what it wants. We've seen a, a series of policy statements. We've seen a non-paper circulated. We've, of course, had... Theresa May, Theresa May's uh, Munich Security Conference uh, speech. And I think from, from all of those documents and speeches and statements, there are three messages that, um, that, uh, that come out. One is keep uh, EU arrangements open, inclusive, flexible for UK engagement, essentially an appeal by the Brits to the EU, to the Commission in particular, to be creative. In, uh, in future um, shaping of such arrangements. to um, consider UK priorities. We've seen, uh, especially in, Munich, in the Munich Security uh, Conference speech, an emphasis on uh, developing capabilities in cyber and space, um, mentioned by, by the uh, Prime Minister. Of course, also access to the European Defence Fund, to the European Defence Agency in this respect. And three, gives a seat at the table, um, mainly the PSC, the, the Permanent Security Council, um, a political and security committee uh, of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the council. Um, and essentially sending out a message, we have the money, we have we spend 40% uh, of the total Europe, European um, uh, R&D on, on defense. We have money and therefore we have influence and we want to basically trade um, the two. On the EU side, um, we've seen the, the foreign affairs conclusions of, uh, of two weeks ago which essentially have delayed the decision on third country participation in, uh, in PESCO. Um, and the European Commission has, uh, has so far also excluded third countries benefiting from uh, EU budget spent on, uh, on R&D and defense, except of course for the well-known situation of, uh, of Norway. We can talk about that later. But otherwise it's been publicly at least, silenced, uh, uh, silent about what the EU uh, wants from, from future collaborative uh, framework in, um, with the UK and CSDP post-Brexit. Uh, post and finally, and most crucially, I think, on, on the fourth factor that I, that I mentioned, the specific nature of uh, CSDP. Here, I think we, we need to make a distinction as to what that collaborative framework for the future might be between, on the one hand, the operational side of CSDP and, on, and on the other hand, the, uh, the structural institutional um, setup within PESCO. On the operational side, um, the UK, and it was mentioned, um, is, is a formidable player, of course, but not so much in EU context itself, not in CSDP. It ranks as the fifth um, biggest military uh, contributor to CSDP operations, but the seventh in terms of civilian uh, missions. And in overall personnel uh, given or uh, provided by EU member states to CSDP, it accounts for about 4.2%. So that's not a whole lot. So the UK chooses different channels, basically, to, uh, to project its 
um, its force um, towards external conflicts and, and crises. Second observation in this respect in the operational sphere is that this is primarily ad hoc in, in nature. And the definition of the rules of engagement as such um, with contributions by third states is defined um, so as to match the, the circumstances of each uh, case. Plus, third countries assume the, their own costs in, in participating in, uh, in operations according to the distributive key which the E provides uh, under, uh, under the Athena uh, mechanism. There is, of course, a more structural format. There is the, the framework participation agreement, um, which um, in principle does not allow for decision-making power of the third uh, state in uh, shaping the CSDP operation to which it will contribute. No participation in the operational planning uh, as such, uh, or in the mandate development, um, nor in the, the force uh, generation conference. But there is a, a participation for third country, uh, third countries in the the committee, uh, the committee of contributors, and um, and the decision shaping uh, process, of course. What Dex EU want, uh, wants, the the department for exiting the EU in its uh, in its non paper, seems to be more than that. An FT, FPA plus a framework participation agreement, plus with um, decision making rights, uh, participation also in, uh, in the definition of the operational plan and, uh, and uh, force generation uh, conference. And that begs the question, of course, whether the EU will want something in return for that. And from a British perspective, one could actually wonder why DEX-EU breaks its tradition with, you know, a more reluctant, uh, reluctant stance towards uh, operational cooperation with uh, with the EU in that respect. I think there's strategic reasons for that, but uh, but we'll hear more about that. Finally, on the structural institutional side, so I, I, I'm, I'm still, if you're with me, um, with the specific nature of CSDP, talked about operations, ad hoc arrangements should, in principle, be easier to uh, to assume some kind of cooperation with the UK in the future. This will be more difficult on the structural institutional side of things, and not just because this is traditionally anathema to uh, the British thinking and, uh, and, and diplomacy in CSDP, um, which has been long against the military headquarters. Okay, we've seen a shift there, uh, which is for a long time uh, denied a bigger budget to the European Defence Agency. Okay, we'll see whether that will um, lead to a shift in position. Um, but maybe uh, more difficult will be PESCO itself and the way it develops. I mentioned before that even if it is based uh, on a legal provision drawn from the Lisbon Treaty, the enforcement mechanism as such is rather weak, um, in, in legal terms at least. There is a suspension mechanism to throw one of the member states participating in PESCO out by qualified majority vote. But that's really the only enforcement mechanism there is. And the rest is political pressure in order to prevent a defection from, um, from stated commitments in, in PESCO or a delay in the delivery uh, on, those, uh, on those commitments. So peer pressure rather, and the political cost which comes from that rather than, than anything in the more traditionally regulatory sense that we've seen within the EU. But my point would be that this does not forego the gradual um, emergence of a regulatory framework within PESCO, and that might be something that hold back, holds back the UK government at this stage to join PESCO. After all, if we have these 17 projects, um, there is an assumption that there will be a convergence on technical standards, at least between those participating, and that as these uh, projects go into their second, third, fourth editions, <laughs> they will be much harder for individual countries in those projects to withdraw from them without any cost. And at, but at the same token, if you have this development, there, there's, um, there's, there's uh, the logical uh, expectation then that a regulatory framework around that might, um, might evolve. For example, on the basis of the procurement directives which have been adopted in 2009 
within the European Union, which are in need of an update and upgrade, and which would steer um, the, the further development of the, um, the single market and defense products and, good, and goods and services, basically, in the future. So I think that there may be um, uh, a certain institutionalization and um, regulatory framework um, solidifying over time, which is of course, always been something that the British government has has resisted, uh, principally in this uh, in this field. And thirdly, and and finally, in in designing uh, the future framework of of cooperation, I think account must be had uh, for the precedent-setting nature for other non-EU member states or non-EU states, uh, rather. Um, Norway has, of course, a unique position in that it uh, that it is part um, of the single market, adopts its uh, its rules, follows its rules, and pays into um, the research program, uh, especially Horizon 2020, which leads, which offers a une bretelle uh, towards the uh, towards the uh, the PESCO defence budget. Um, I think it's unlikely that the UK will mirror or surpass that type of um, status that, that Norway has established over time uh, with, uh, with the EU and in uh, the, def the defense sphere. So and if and when it does, if and when it is ready to take that step, then sh certainly there will be conditions attached to, to Britain to, and to go the same way, meaning accepting the rules and judicial oversight um, without having a seat at the table in as far as procurement and defense is concerned. And uh, second, pay into the general budget of the European Union so as to benefit from whatever money might come online through that, uh, through that budget for defense planning. Is that acceptable to the UK government? Open question, I, uh, I assume. I've spoken too much, um, but I'm happy to um, uh, to engage with you on, on any of the points that uh, that I've thrown up. At this stage, more dust, I'm afraid, than um, than than clarity allows for. Thanks. Thank you, Stephen, for a very clear presentation about something that is quite unclear still. Um, our next speaker here today is going to speak a bit more about the British side of things. Uh, Garvin Walsh is the CEO of Brexit Analytics, which is an organization that provides technically informed advice on how Brexit will affect businesses. And he's also a former national and international security policy advisor to the British Conservative Party. So he has a bit of insight, I think. Um, Today, Garvin will speak about an issue that is extremely uh, timely given the events this week in the UK, namely Brexit, European security and the dimensions of Russian power. So Garvin, the floor is yours. Thank, thank you very much, Kristen, and thank you to Nupi for inviting me. And I want to begin with an apology, an apology on behalf of my party. Um, which has, um, by failing to win that referendum, um, inflicted upon you at least another five years of um, Brexit-related discussions and debates and seminars like this. Um, this is without taking a position on the referendum itself, in which my party was formerly neutral. Um, and I also want to let you in on a secret, because um, the media usually report me as a Brit, but actually, I have an Irish passport. <laughs> and not only do I have an Irish passport, but I made... I made sure that I was born in Ireland. But just in case that wasn't enough, I made sure that my parents were born in Ireland too. And in case that wasn't enough, I made sure that my grandfather um, was so keen that his children and grandchildren would be born in Ireland that he joined a group of, uh, let's call them freedom fighters, in 1919 to ensure that there was an independent Ireland um, that could stay in the EU after, um, <laughs> after the British decided to vote for Brexit. Um, and I, I had originally want, I was originally going to give um, a talk about the, the, the structures of um, European cooperation and how, in defense and how Britain might um, be involved in those after Brexit because, as um, Stefan said, of course, um, Britain is very keen, um, as the British Prime Minister says, 
that although we're not we're leaving the EU, we're not leaving Europe, and even right wing, very strong conservative Eurosceptics are very committed to the to European security, to the Atlantic Alliance, and a few exceptions on the fringes aside, want to stay involved in maintaining European defence and security policy. The tricky bit is working out exactly how this might be done in a structured fashion. And um, I want to draw your attention to um, three, um, three, three particular ways of, of, um, uh, of three people who have, um, one of four people, one of whom is myself, who have um, got involved in um, working these out. One is Sophia Besch, uh, an excellent analyst with the Center for, Euro for European Reform, who has a piece coming out very shortly that I urge you all to read. The second one is, is Ian Bond, also from the Center for European Reform, who has just written a piece called uh, Plugging in the British. He takes a relatively minimalist line um, um, closer to the UK being an ordinary third country and trying to cooperate as much as possible. Um, I also want to um, flag up a piece that I am working with Charles Tannock, the British MEP, um, on, um, which calls for the revival of the Western European Union. Uh, we will be publishing this imminently. The, the, I'm um, doing back and forths over the last draft uh, with the typesetters at the moment. And among, among the things we're talking about, perhaps the most radical proposal in this is for a, a shared defense market so that um, Britain and Europe can continue, despite this um, mess of Brexit, somehow to um, benefit from non-discriminatory defense procurement across this area. And, and we're making this argument that um, in this particular case, um, the, this, is just, this exception is justified, though of course um, other people would describe this as cherry picking. We, this is something we... Um, um, can, we, repeat, we repeatedly deny. But this week, this week has been a, um, a very um, important and serious week in um, European security and, the role, and particularly in Britain's role in European security. Um, it, it saw the um, assassination of a former uh, Russian spy who had been exchanged with the British um, by um, a nerve agent um, made by a nerve agent made by the Soviet Union uh, of an enemy of uh, Russia um, in Britain. Um, now, Russia, of course, denies this in the same way that Russia also denied invading Crimea. Russia also denied being involved in shooting down of the MH17, um, MH17 aircraft. And Russia denies a lot of things. In fact, um, it may be said that a good, good reason for something to have happened is that Russia denied it first. Uh, <laughs> um, we <coughs> so it's an opportunity not just to talk about structures, which are incredibly important, and which Stefan has um, explained in tremendous um, detail already, but also to talk about what the structures are for. Because it doesn't quite make sense to define structures without having missions um, to, to, use, to use the structures in the first place. And there are clearly two sources of political instability, um, uh, two major sources of political instability um, in, in that affect Europe at the moment. Um, one, of course, is the instability emanating from the, what I would say is the collapse of the Arab nationalist um, model of governance in the Middle East and North Africa. Um, coming at the same time as a uh, heightened Islamic revivalism that is partly related to the um, battle uh, for influence between um, Iran and Saudi Arabia, and all the, the wars and conflicts and refugee flows and state failure that come from um, that battle and that process. <coughs> but the other, and the, other, the, the other issue that affects us now and it's be, it should have been clear since 2008 when um, Georgia was invaded, um, is Russia. And a desire by, um, a desire by the um, Russian state and by Vladimir Putin to recover some of the lost influence, um, to recover some of the influence that Russia lost as a result of its Cold War collapse. He famously described the um, collapse of the Soviet Union as the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the, of the 20th century. And he's decided to use Russia's resources and power um, to go about remedying what he sees as that 
um, mistake and failure. And this m matters particularly. Uh, this matters particularly because Brexit has led to a convulsion in British politics. It has led not only to a convulsion in British politics in my own Conservative Party, um, where we are um, deeply divided by a Brexit policy between people who would re uh, reconcile themselves to um, a compromise between their ideal EU membership and the referendum result by adopting something similar to the solution that Norway has, and hard Brexiteers who want to be as far out um, as possible, and in the tradition of these things, because we have to call these models after countries full of snow, they would prefer a Canadian-type relationship. Um, <clears throat> and then, um, but it's also convulsed the Labour Party. And the, it has led to this particular man, um, Jeremy Corbyn, to be, um, who pulled off an astonishing um, feat of taking over the Labour Party from the extreme left. It's allowed him to consolidate his position. It's allowed him to entrench his position and be able to lead <clears throat> and embed um, a new kind of position um, in the Labour Party. And I give you this picture because I took this picture myself. Um, it was in the middle of the referendum campaign. And instead of campaigning for the official um, policy of the Labour Party, Jeremy Corbyn was addressing the Communist Party of Great Britain um, in Trafalgar Square in London on May Day 2016. I happened to be there and um, snapped um, this picture of him. And it, this, is Im this is important because just this week, <coughs> uh, as Theresa May um, announced the results of the investigation into the, into the poisoning and announced the re, um, conclusions that this was in fact the Novichok uh, agent produced by the Soviet Union and that um, Russia was responsible for this assassination. Um, Jeremy Corbyn instead, uh, instead of trusting the intelligence services of the country he hopes to lead, um, deci um, decided to echo the Russian line, which is that yes, perhaps it could have been, but perhaps it had been some chemical agent that had gone astray somewhere. And someone, um, perhaps from another state, it had fallen, fallen off the back of a lorry as a um, famous British um, comedian, comedian once said. <clears throat> Perhaps it had been something else. And he repeated this remark in an article in The Guardian today. Um, so w as well as this, he is someone who is skeptical of the um, British nuclear deterrent. He is, he is on record as being skeptical of the value of NATO. Um, he is known to be an anti-European as well. He's just paralyzed by his party into not quite being the Brexiteer he fully wants to be. Um, but despite all this, and because of Brexit, because Brexit has led to the defection from the Conservative Party of prosperous middle-class urban voters, he's doing very well in the opinion polls. The traditional view would be someone like this had t would have taken over the Labour Party, and Labour would have fallen down to about 20%. Instead, they're about 40% in the polls, roughly the same position as the Conservative Party. And if we <coughs> put these results into predictors of the parliamentary arithmetic that could happen after the next election <coughs> in Britain, we get the, fol we get the following result. Um, we get the Conservatives and their allies, the Democratic Unionists, being able to muster about 307 seats. Um, and Labour and the Scottish National Party, both of whom um, well, the Labour situation is more complicated. Jeremy Corbyn is against uh, renewing Britain's nuclear deterrent. The Labour Party itself is in favour of retaining it because the trade unions who employ a lot of the people who work on the programme have managed to secure that policy. But if Jeremy Corbyn wins a, a general election, he will be in a much more powerful position to be able to do that. So they have, and the Scottish Nationalist Party also have a similar uh, neutralist position. That leads to about 316 seats. Um, if opinion polls stay as they are, it is most likely that Jeremy Corbyn will become um, Prime Minister of um, the United Kingdom and will do so in a way um, in a, at a time when Russia is continuing on its um, 
attempt to ex exp expand influence. But although Russia has the you know, tradition of a superpower, and although Russia has the um, self-will of a former superpower, it doesn't actually have the economy of a, so, uh, of a superpower. Um, here is Russia, Ru Russia's, Russia's GDP, 1.6 trillion. Um, the Nordic countries, 1.3 trillion. Benelux, 1.4 trillion. Uh, even Spain and Portugal, 1.7. But perhaps most surprisingly, Canada's GDP is greater than Russia's. Obviously, obviously it doesn't, Canada does not spend 5.6% of that GDP on defense. But um, what these figures show you is that the strategic problem Russia poses should be the kind of problem that it is within Europe's capabilities to solve, even if the United States um, is... Um, unable to concentrate on this because it has a surprisingly, um, as a president surprisingly sympathetic to Russia and is involved in its own internal struggles because of um, the Trump administration and what um, he means for, for American, American democracy. But in order, in order to do this, um, we need, we need, as Europeans, to start thinking about the dimensions of the Russian approach. To think about, it's not simply a military threat, though the military threat is there, and NATO exists to um, deter and counteract that military, military threat. Sorry, you were taking a picture. I'll, I'll put it back. <laughs> it's, this, this, this table is also available on Twitter. Um, but, you know, R Russia's... Russia's approach, because it is a smaller power, isn't to use direct force, but to seize opportunities to take advantage of its willingness to push the boundaries um, that uh, other states committed to defending the international order are not. And I would say it does this on these um, five um, dimensions. And we need to have what, when I did counterterrorism policy, we would call a counterterrorism, a comprehensive approach. And uh, we need instruments across our political institutions that are able to deal with each of these dimensions. And counteracting Russia, therefore, has to be, or securing ourselves um, against um, Vladimir Putin's um, policies, needs to be something that um, will extend beyond um, purely military area to other, er to other areas as well. Um, so. Russia's military forces are well known. There's the PAD exercises, their involvement in Ukraine, their uh, inv invasion of Georgia, <coughs> um, their, even their attack on an American military base in Syria under the guise of a private military company very closely linked to the Kremlin uh, called Wagner, um, uh, which did not go very well. Um, the, th this stuff is well known. Secondly, there's the question of its uh, famous energy weapon. Uh, about 10 years ago, it used to describe itself as an energy superpower. It cut off gas to Ukraine. It has constructed at very great expense pipelines um, across, across the North Sea to try and allow it to supply Western Europe without um, having to supply Eastern Europe at the same time. This is an area in which the EU has been very effective at um, counteracting uh, Russian, uh, Rus Russian policy and not least helped by Norway. As I was getting on the plane um, from Brussels, advertised on the jetway was <coughs> um, an, uh, gas from the um, company formerly known as Statoil um, <laughs> that said, European gas from Norway. <laughs> Saying, don't worry, your gas is safe with us. Um, so here, and th you know, through a network of interconnectors, through the use of LNG, and through other measures, um, um, it's, it's possible to um, counteract that Russian influence. The third area is corruption. Because Russia is an extractive state, uh, it's very easy for the people at the top to have vast resources at their disposal and put them to the service of Russian foreign policy, ex foreign policy objectives in the way that uh, other, con other countries do not. They're able to... Um, so Paul Manafort, who was recently named in the Mueller um, indict, one of the Mueller indictments in America, can, um, can <coughs> obtain, obtain the services, among other, among other people, of a former European chancellor. Um, 
it doesn't, this does not have, seem to have been Gerhard Schroeder in this case. The um, Politico reported it was a, a former Austrian um, chancellor. But um, Gerhard Schroeder, of course, works for Gazprom. That's a well-known, well, that, 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 is, that, is, that is a well-known fact. And while he doesn't um, do um, anything that could be described as, as corrupt, what, they, what is happening here is that Russia is buy, buying influence in a way that would be, um, that doesn't, does not work in the interests of the publics of, of Europe and the interest in institutions in Europe. And there are other countries where institutions are weaker than they are, they are, they are in Germany, where they, um, <coughs> where Russian influence is, is, is significant, where um, anti-corruption um, institutions are under, under pressure. And it should be the job of particularly the, the countries with strong institutions um, in, Northern, in Northern Europe and in the European Union as a whole to work out how they can strengthen the enforcement of anti-corruption measures across um, the European space. This is, this is one of the ways we can limit the advance of um, uh, Russian influence and the power of unaccountable Russian money in, uh, in European politics and continue to protect our interests. The fourth element is ideology. Unlike in the Cold War, Russia doesn't have a <clears throat> an ideology it's trying to promote across the world. What it ha what it has um, is a way of undermining faith in our own institutions and appealing to a fashionable relativism to be able to say, well, um, they're all just as bad as each other. Everyone is cynical. Everyone's corrupt. Everyone's on the make. And if everyone's on the corrupt, then if they're just as bad as us, then we're just as good as them. This allows, um, and it promotes this through its its state its state owned media. It promotes it promotes this through um, uh, the kind of moral relativism that has been displayed by the leader of the Labour Party in the UK, and through plenty of other uh, other fields. And quest question is here is how how can we respond to that? How do we build up um, enough faith and defence of our institutions so that we can protect ourselves not just against Russian manipulation, but also against genuine domestic um, populists that Russia seeks to assist. Um, I, this, I think, is going to be a bigger question as migration flows increase um, over the nec next decades, and there will be understandable um, concern on the part of European populations about how these people can be integrated. There are some, some examples in this area may come from the way Germany has managed to develop a a strong political culture following World War, World War II. It doesn't see itself just as a, a neutral liberal society, but it thinks it's got important political values that it can it can depend it can defend and should be defended uh, by the constitutional system of the um, German state, and I would argue by other European states too. <coughs> fifth one, fifth one is algorithms. We hear an awful lot about how Russia has bots, how Russia has social media, how it has troll farms. It's all true. They're not doing anything special, though. They're just doing what commercial companies do in ordinary marketing activities um, to sell products. They've just simply put that into a political, political device. What we lack are the policy instruments and the um, organizations to ca counteract uh, this kind of activity. There is a very important European disinformation center, a uh, counter disinformation center, sorry, in the external action, <laughs> in the external action service. Um, um, but it isn't enough. Just, just one, uh, one example, a friend of mine decided he was going to spread true news in, um, in Russia. So he bought Facebook ads and started um, advertising on Facebook with the output, I think, of the BBC, Russian service, in Russia to Russians in small Russian towns. This is, these networks are open to Russians, but they're actually also open to us in Russia and in other authoritarian states to promote um, real news, high quality media. Uh, it's worth asking, where is the Voice of America or the <coughs> um, Radio for Europe or the Vojtovela for social media? Are we doing enough in this area? Can we do more? Can European institutions, can, can Norway through its um, Norway grant system do more in this area to promote the rule of law, to promote impartial information. Um, these are all parts, I would argue, um, of a comprehens comprehensive approach. Um, and I think we need um, to deal with the challenges of today to treat 
um, following Brexit and following possibly the um, neutralization of the United Kingdom. Uh, that that didn't, doesn't work right in English, sorry. Uh, the neutralism, uh, potential neutralism of the, of the United Kingdom. How can we um, deal with this um, phenomenon and this sort of, they have a very comprehensive strategy, so our security strategy should be just as comprehensive as there. And I have a series of measures, but I'll just leave them, I'll just post them on Twitter later and not bore you any longer <laughs> with these. So thank you for that, Garvin. I think you you supplemented what Stephen said very, very nicely. You talked about what I think in, in his four, four level structure was the global political environment uh, and how that impacts on what is happening now. And I think uh, our next speaker will take us a bit closer to, to home, to, to Norway. Uh, Östen Bø is, uh, is Norway's incoming ambassador to NATO. We are very pleased to have you here today. He's currently a senior advisor in the Norwegian MFA, where he's had a long career, and he's also been a state secretary for the Norwegian Conservative Party uh, in the Norwegian Ministry of Defence. And he's going to talk about Brexit and security defence policy in a broader perspective, but also uh, more specifically from a Norwegian point of view. So thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you, Kristin, and thank you to Nupi for inviting me to share some views on... Um, and thoughts on Brexit and the uh, security policy and defense implications. Uh, as you mentioned in your introduction, that's a tricky task because it has not, this particular field has not been in the forefront of the discussions and um, the EU UK talks. So it's much about guessing, qualified guessing, I hope. And uh, I will, you have to bear with me if uh, I um, overlap some of the things that Stephen said because it's, I touch on many of the same issues. As, as we understand, Brexit will no doubt have great implications for the UK and for Europe, and it will also affect most likely third countries, like Norway. And of course then the views on how that will happen depends on where we stand. Norway, we have placed ourselves outside the EU and inside NATO. Then again, we, don't, we, we have to be careful not to oversimplify this, because as you all know, we are much more than a, 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 we have much more of a relationship to the EU than just not being a member. And uh, while we put much emphasis on our transatlantic uh, link, we definitely also work closely with our European allies and our EU partners. I need only mention the, the EEA agreement, third party arrangements, military contributions, and so on. And it's important for Norway to maintain the two strategic windows, both towards the Atlantic, the, the transatlantic, and, and towards Europe. Seeing a development towards new dividing lines in Europe or across the Atlantic would run against our vital interests. Uh, Stephen touched upon, or no, you touched upon, Kristin, on your, your inbox. I guess your inbox was fuller just following the, the Brexit referendum than it is now on some of these issues. Um, we saw a lot of opinions and, and, and articles on Brexit, CF, CFSP, CSDP, just following the referendum. Uh, but then the attention soon turned to more topical issues like uh, trade, like uh, customs with, between Northern Ireland and Ireland and so on. But it seems like lately these topics have gained, gained some momentum. And Stephen mentioned this, uh, the non-paper of September that the British pu published, which lists the UK contributions to the EU in, in the realm of, of foreign policy and security policy over the years. It also lists the UK expectations for their participation in the CFSP and the CSDP following their departure. And it sets the tones by, it sets the tone by, by emphasizing that the UK envisages a future cooperation with the EU that is especially in nature and is, I quote, deeper than any current third country partnership and, and reflects our shared interest. Of course, it remains to see whether 
the EU agree to that, and whether whether um, this will be the result. But given our close relationship with the EU, we will of course follow very closely this 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 the development. And then just a bit more than a week ago, the president of the EU Council, Donald Tusk, he uh, sent to the 27 remainers uh, his his draft guidelines on for the EU relationship with the UK after Brexit. In presenting these guidelines, Mr. Tusk said the following, the increasing global instability requires our uninterrupted cooperation in defense and security and, and, and foreign affairs. This is about the security of our citizens, which must be preserved beyond Brexit. The draft guidelines, they do not address defense and security in detail, but they clearly state the wish to have an as close as possible partnership with the UK in, in security, defense, and foreign policy. They aim at a situation, and I quote from the guidelines, with no gap in the EU-UK cooperation as a consequence of the UK withdrawal from the Union. They also set forth that a future partnership should, should, should respect the autonomy of the Union's decision-making and foresee appropriate dialogue, consultation, exchange of information and cooperation mechanisms. Furthermore, they have a prerequisite that it needs to be in, an, an agreement on, on uh, security of information. So far, these guidelines have just been put before the EU, EU27, and it remains to see how they will look like in the end. Our assessment of today, as regards the UK, is that Brexit will not have any immediate negative consequences for the UK's military role or for NATO, which is important to us. The UK has said that after Brexit, it will give, in, give even greater importance to NATO and to multilateral cooperation, something that we welcome. And it's a, it's a fun fact that following the, Brexit, follow, following the British withdrawal, 80% of NATO's defense expenditure will come from non-EU countries. There is already in Europe a considerable dynamic in, in, in regional, regional defense cooperation, in particular in, in Northern Europe, with the UK as a leading nation. Joint Expeditionary Force is a manifestation of the UK as a major European player and as Norway's key European ally. Another example is the Northern Group, again with the, with, with the UK lead and which brings in non-allied countries like Sweden and Finland. There are many reasons for increased regional defense cooperation in Europe. It's partly about achieving synergies among like-minded allies. It also comes as a result of Russia's more assertive security policy, which is clearly visible also in the North. Brexit may leave some uncertainty regarding the UK's broader international role. The EU plays an important role in major foreign policy questions, including Russia, Ukraine, and Iran. Following Brexit, the UK will no longer have a seat at the table, and formal power will have to be replaced by influence and by lobbying. <coughs> and then the UK have some currency. Stephen touched upon some of it. They have a global outlook, which not many other EU countries, except France has. They have expeditionary ability, which also goes for France, but not, not any other EU countries. They have a particular stance in intelligence, which, which you touched upon. And they have good knowledge on Russia. These are all important assets that are valuable to the EU. So I take it, or I assume, that when Tusk's Tusk underlined the need for these relations to be preserved beyond Brexit. These are some of the so-called hard currency issues that he would have in mind. And then the UK has also traditionally had a private role as a link between Europe and North America. And as a new member, we have seen the UK, with the UK as a new member and not Norway, <laughs> we have seen the UK as a guarantee against development of structures duplicating 
duplicating NATO and new roles. It will now be interesting to see how this will play out without the UK at the EU table. Will other members be willing or able to take this role? Poland could be one possibility. Will they have enough weight? I don't know. We will have to see. Brexit has also caused questions on the EU's position in key, in key foreign policy issues. UK has been promoting a, a tough EU policy, including on Russia. The question is, and the question I remember discussing this with, with colleagues uh, in my former job, there were some worry in the EU, among EU members, on whether the unity on, let's say, sanctions against Russia would hold. Uh, there are different outlooks among EU states, and, and there is, of course, a question, will this hold with the, EU, with, with the UK on the outside? Uh, Garvan, you mentioned this week's great happenings in Salisbury. I, I think we've seen a solidarity with the UK from major EU countries on uh, Russia's role in this that, that actually bodes well for the future that will have some kind of unity and, and that will not fall apart in, 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 in important issues like the handling of Russia. But that also remains to be seen. Then, of course, the EU's military role is still limited. As I mentioned, the UK and France are Europe's only expeditionary powers. And uh, if the EU if the EU aim at increasing its defense abilities or ambitions, loss of, of UK assets will most probably have an impact. Although many would claim, and as you also mentioned, that the, that the UK has, as a matter of fact, not participated much in the CSDP operations. It did so following 1972 in the 70s, in the, in the 80s and so on, but lately it's been more focusing on NATO or on counter ISIL operations. But still, uh, following, f f following Brexit, uh, there will be, of course, a less access within the EU to handle military operations. And as you mentioned, Stephen, in the aftermath of the Brexit, Brexit referendum, we saw a rather quick reaction from some EU member states on further development of EU defense. This kettle is still simmering, um, and we're now seeing a new dynamism in the EU when it comes to some aspects of, of, of defense and security related issues. Contrary to some expectations, one might even see security and defense as an arena where that strengthens the unity within the EU instead of dividing it. The EU has, and that was mentioned also earlier, over the last couple of years taken several important initiatives to strengthen the cooperation within security and defense, and a strong and a well-coordinated EU that takes greater responsibility for, for, for European security is, of course, good to all of us. PESCO and the European Defence Fund are examples of this. And I believe that, this, that the discussion on more cooperation within security and defence probably could have come about regardless of, of, of Brexit. But still, I believe it's fair to say that with the Brexit, the pressure on the brake pedal <laughs> has eased. And uh, these initiatives are probably being realized at the greater speed and, and easier than they would have been without Brexit. They are still in what we could call the design phase. And it is still not entirely clear how they would look like. And it seems to me that ambitions are probably greater than what will happen in reality. PESCO is an EU only EU at 25. Uh, exercise, but it may open possibility for other countries to join individual PESCO projects. That is a possibility that we would look well into uh, making use of and hoping to be, to, to be able to, to, uh, to join. The European Defence Fund, it is important with transparency towards an EU, EU non-allies and coherence with NATO processes in this development. Norway participates in the EU, EU's preparatory, preparatory action on, on defense research as the only non-member state. And we believe it important that we are also invited to participate in the European Defense Industrial Development Program. We believe that 
innovation participation would be of mutual interest and benefit to all parties involved. And, and I'd like to, well, that could be another time, but I'd like to take issue with you on the, uh, what, you, what you call a, a, a European defense market and a non-discriminatory market. If there is one failure of the latter years in, in, in the defense acquisition uh, sphere, that is, to my mind, the, the EU defense material directive, which is not working properly, which is not creating the non-discriminatory market it was supposed to do. Still, both the UK and France don't really let others into their own markets. Uh, but that's, that's another discussion. There are several reasons for, for, for why, why we should be involved in the, in the um, industrial development program, high-tech Norwegian defense industry, in, integral part of the, of, of the European market, or at least we should be. And, and uh, we're also heavily involved in defense research. Summing up, Brexit is a key moment in European history. And the next few months, next year, will be crucial. The climate and the negotiations between London and, and Brussels will obviously be key. Uh, so far, I've been saying, you know, there is really no intensive for, in, in incentive for the, EU, for the EU to give the Brits a very, very good agreement if they think about, you know, signal effects and so on. But, but there are also many others aspect, other aspects to play in there. So far, defense has not been at the heart of this the negotiations, but if the temperature rises, it could spill over into, into the defense area. And I believe it's important that pragmatism prevails over prestige, in particular in defense and foreign policy. There are clear incentives for increased European defense cooperation, but of course it's a key question whether this will take place inside or outside the EU or preferably, but much more difficult, in the interface between NATO and the EU. The present uncertainty underlines the importance of a deep, de de deepened cooperation between NATO and the EU, based on the joint declaration from Warsaw. We see progress in this, in this process. There are already 74 measures agreed. I think one of the most important is the one on military mobility in opening transport corridors through Europe, which is, uh, to, to my mind, uh, a very good example of the good deeds that could happen in this interface. And within this overarching frameworks, um, I believe that regional and bilateral defense cooperation will also in the future be very important elements. Norway is, of course, not involved. In the, in the negotiations, but we are much more than an observer. Through the EEA agreement, Norway is part of the EU internal market, and we are an active contributor to the CSDP. Hence, arguing that Norway has an interest in the outcome would not be an overstatement. One question of interest in the wake of Brexit is, of course, the institutional ties that will develop between the UK and the EU related to the CSDP regarding both security policy questions and participation in EU-led operations. We are, in Norway, an active partner in the CSDP, and it will be important for us to follow the discussions on any new forms of association and cooperation closely. In isolation, Brexit could mean a weakening of the Western institutional system. At a time of increased geo geopolitical challenge, where actually the opposite should happen. So it's vital to avoid further dividing lines in Europe or, or across the Atlantic. There seems to be a positive approach from both sides, but as President Tusk said last week, this, this doesn't change the fact that because of Brexit, the EU and the UK will drift apart. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stan. If I could ask all our panelists to please uh, take a seat up here and we will move over to a uh, debate and we will also open up for questions. While we do that, and I think uh, your tr three introductions were supplementing each other in a very nice way. I think they gave all of us in the room quite a bit of, of uh, food for thought. And I thought before we open up for questions, I, I thought I would just 
take the opportunity to, to ask you all a question. You all touched upon this. You know, it's about a lot more than military capabilities, the issue of European security cooperation. Do you think that Britain is putting too much em emphasis on its military capabilities in this process? Is it using that card too much? Uh, we could start with Stephen, maybe. I don't know, really. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure if I have a, a straight answer for you. Um, of course, it, there was the anticipation at the beginning of the process that the UK would play this card very heavily um, in exchange for concessions by, um, by the EU27 through the European Commission as a negotiator in, in other fields, uh, access to the single market, uh, uh, for example. If you look at it from that perspective, I think you know the answer to your question would be negative. Uh, the UK hasn't, in fact, pushed very hard. Um, it's it's supposed you know um, bargaining chip in this respect, um, and the DexEU paper, which I refer to, um, suggests that the UK is actually demandeur. Um, you know, to have a very close cooperation with an evolving uh, structure in uh, in PESCO, and and that would suggest that in fact it has given up uh, part of that uh, bargaining chip. Um, I think that the the pendulum, you know, will probably swing back a little bit uh, after the Munich Security Conference speech by by Theresa May. Uh, how hard they will play this is uh, is a question we'd have to ask the, the British government. Um, I, I think at, at, at the beginning of the uh, Brexit negotiating process, there was a strong desire in the UK to play what they call their, their security surplus card. And they felt that they would be able to extract concessions by using, by using this. And some of it was no noticeable in the uh, letter to invoke Article 50, where the UK suggested that a trade deal might be um, contingent on future um, counterterrorism cooperation. In her speech in Florence, Theresa May uh, changed uh, her policy on that. She moved to a much more emollient um, position. And a lot of that's got to do with changing British dom domestic political circumstances. Uh, her, in her inability to win a majority at the election she called in June last year meant that her domestic position was weakened and she therefore had to listen to more to um, pro-Europeans within the cabinet and particularly within the Foreign Office and Defence Ministry who argued that um, this wasn't going to be a successful negotiating um, uh, posture, not least because um, Britain would be cutting off its nose to spite its face. Um, European security and British security are so intertwined that um, it wouldn't really be uh, viable for the UK to threaten to withhold um, cooperation. On the other side of the debate, there is, a, there is a question about how much European security the UK actually provides through its EU membership as opposed to its NATO membership and bilateral relations. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, I ran an exercise at the um, Baltic Defence College uh, where I asked the assembled um, military officers to pretend they were the European Council, deciding on whether to accept Britain's deep and special partnership uh, arrangement. And I, I rigged the game to have two um, countries, which I called Poland and Sweden, who were supposed to take the pro-British side, and two other countries that I called Italy and France that were supposed to take the um, you are a third country and therefore you have left side. Um, despite my energetic attempt to rig the game, even Poland, the, you know, Poland and Sweden um, uh, rejected the British offer. And the reasons they gave for rejecting that British offer were principally that they realized that the UK would be uh, continue to provide military security through, through its NATO commitments. This wasn't going to affect that, they argued. And they thought that the EU alliance was a political alliance and it was important to remain part of the political alliance on the terms of that political alliance and not, not dilute it. So um, <clears throat> that gave me a strong sense that even among uh, countries that Britain, and these were military officers that tend to be uh, closer to a British view of things than professional diplomats might often be. Even those people were skeptical of the British offer, which suggests that um, it probably won't succeed. And it, w it was never really a very strong British card in the first place. 
others not yeah. much to add actually but i mentioned in my uh my speech that that i believe that the uk have some has some hard currency here but i don't believe they will play it openly i believe this will be a a balanced solution where uh, there will it will be taken into account the strong and weak sides and and how can we make these arrangements best possible thank you okay so we will take a couple of questions from the audience i already have nina greger on my list thank you yeah thank you for those very interesting introductions these are really exciting times uh, I guess I, uh, my questions will not be answered, but I'll post them anyway. Um, it seems to me that there will be more of a split uh, in this area now um, uh, after Brexit, since, uh, like uh, Oistan Burr just said, um, uh, it's likely that there will be no one now in the EU that can put on the brakes in, c in the case of EU wanting to rather um, su not supplement or complement, but sort of develop its own uh, military capabilities now, now when the UK is, you know, out of the EU. Uh, on the other hand, do you think that that uh, the EU-NATO relationship could actually be better and more interesting because the e UK would be on the outside and then would, you know, take an interest in getting that relationship up and going? Second uh, comment or question is more about Turkey. Uh, are there any sort of indications that Turkey will use this opportunity to try to get a security agreement uh, with the EU and, and improve its position, right? Um, finally, uh, what would be the best Norwegian strategy now? Uh, would it be to sit on the fence and wait and see what's happening or just go there and try to, you know, walk down all the corridors and, and see what we can do in order to improve our sort of relationship with the, with the CSTP and the EU in this area? It seems to me that at least the UK uh, is expecting a lot more than the other third countries have ever, you know, been able to, to, to manage to get in, in terms of an agreement with the EU. Thank you. Okay, so these were three rather complicated questions, I'd say. So maybe we should give you an opportunity to, to address them. Uh, you, you're free to, you, you don't have to address all the questions, but if you would like to, Stephen, for instance, if you'd like to start. Oh, you, you may want to wish. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, on the development of the EU defense, uh, as I said, you know, I believe that the the spoken ambitions are probably larger than what will be possible to come up with. And uh, anyway, how we turn this around, we're speaking about the same resources. We've had that same same complex when we spoke about you know NATO and UN operations. About you know, it's the same soldiers, it's the same equipment, and to my mind. The EU NATO cooperation, if that track can lead somewhere, it should probably lead us to a situation where we accept that NATO and EU has have two different toolboxes. If you look at Ukraine, you know the EU toolbox would probably be much more useful than than what NATO has in in its toolbox. So I think that is, and this is not a question about duplicating or not duplicating, but it's actually a question of coming out with the best possible result. On Turkey, I won't comment that. Uh, on on uh, what was your last question again? That was that I should know. <laughs> no, I I believe you know we already have a, one of our largest mission is, missions is the EU mission. Their job is to run down the corridors and do exactly what you say. Find out what's happening. Be there when it's happening and. In in the MFA system, we, we work hard all the time to, to get all the best possible solutions. Um, just start on the EU EU um, NATO relationship. I think that if if the Conservative Party stays in power in the UK, I think it's a good opportunity for it to show that it's still committed to European security and Western security, and I think there will be a strong desire. Um, on the part of a conservative government to to do that, it opens up opportunities for cooperation. Um, it op opens up um, opportunities to persuade Britain that it needs to show that it um, um, means that it is committed to EU security. Um, there was even a proposal yesterday um, from one of the most anti-European fringe um, conservative MPs and possible future conservative leader Jacob Rees-Mogg to increase the British presence in the Baltics as part of their commitments 
um, to European security after, after Brexit. This shows how, how broad it is on that side of the political spectrum. The other side of the political spectrum is much more problematic because the Labour Party is um, is divided on this with its leader uh, very sceptical of, of NATO cooperation and the EU, in fact, sceptical of international institutions generally. Um, but the traditional um, pro-NATO um, left-wing British position is um, still strong within the party, it's strong within the trade unions, and there is an opportunity for strengthening um, relations. This sort of leads me on to the third question, while ducking the second, which I also won't comment on. Um, and the, <coughs> the third question, um, it's, you know, there's a role for Norway and for the other Nordic countries and for countries that are not thought to be conventional um, military powers to work on the left of British politics and persuade them and act as sort of guarantors of that that the NATO that being involved in NATO isn't excessively warmongery, um, which is the, which is the fear. And if and if you and if you can do that, I think you can go some way to binding even a um, far left British government into the international security structures. Yeah, so the <laughs> Turkey, <laughs> the, yes, yeah. indeed. The, <laughs> the downside of having suggested the reverse order um, <laughs> leaves me with the with the hot potato. Um, <laughs> Turkish, um, Turkey's strategic alliances seem to shift uh, by the week um, as, as opportunities or, or threats uh, evolve, uh, with Russia one day um, to, to the very bottom uh, and, and the other week, um, you know, full realignment, uh, it would seem. Uh, with the US, we've seen, uh, we've seen Ankara's uh, strategic posturing uh, there too. With the EU, it's in a, in a completely different uh, ball game, of course, um, where we expect next month uh, the commission to come out would will effectively be a regress report rather than a progress report in its uh, pre-accession process uh, to, to stress the dysfunctionality of the, the central uh, strategic um, and policy framework that we have uh, with Turkey. Um, and which has already been um, bypassed left and right with all kinds of escape routes uh, to settle the migration issue, um, to, to project uh, a potentially more favorable cooperation when modernizing the customs union, with Turkey signaling that uh, they might even take the necessary measures so as to allow the EU to take a decision on visa liberalization. Um, and with um, otherwise in the in a more military sphere, having played a very um, unconstructive role in in allowing the EU to mobilize NATO assets and intelligence through the Berlin Plus uh, arrangements. If you look at it from that uh, perspective, more more strategically, um, I don't I don't think you know. Assuming that Turkey would want. To um, to jump on the bag wagon uh, of uh, of Brexit and uh, reassess its own strategic relationship with the with the European Union in the in the new security uh, treaty, uh, that it would avoid you know being caught by any of the other um, uh, links which which are under stress uh, at the moment uh, with the European Union. And particularly from the, in this military perspective, the Berlin Plus arrangements would uh, would almost suggest that the EU would not be uh, very favourable to, uh, to to offering too many concessions uh, to to Turkey in the in the security uh, sphere. Um, and I don't see where the European Union would be uh, would, would be demandeur um, on. Uh, on such issues, other than perhaps uh, when when Turkey starts stirring up the the Eastern Mediterranean, um, we've seen some pinpricks. But um, so I mean, I don't I don't have a, a sharp answer for you on on these issues. But that that would be more or less the landscape in which an answer would have to be found. Thank you. Okay, we have a question up here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ot Gunnar Skagestad. I'm an old age pensioner and an independent analyst. My question is for Mr. Einstein Bö, since it, con it pertains to the 
the possible implications of Brexit for Norway, although it has a much broader scope. And that's about the uh, institutional framework for the uh, regional management regimes, management of the marine living resources. We have had for the past f almost 40 years a rather stable architecture in Europe, in Northwestern Europe especially, uh, for handling those matters. Uh, and uh, in a year from now, if Brexit materializes, that's a big if, but uh, nevertheless, in that case, this regime is going to e evaporate. And we'll have a very complicated and messy process of renegotiating the uh, fisheries agreements, the framework agreement between Norway and EU. We have to, uh, to start negotiating a new framework agreement between Norway and the UK, and I'm not talking about the annual quota agreements and negotiations. So there is going to be a quite new situation, which I believe most people, most people in, in uh, responsible positions aren't quite prepared for. So uh, my question is, what would you see would be the implications, security politi uh, politically wise, for the Brexit uh, as far as Norway and also other European countries, the EU, as far as the management of living resources is concerned. Thank you. Okay, we'll, we'll take one more. We have question Fries here. Thank you. Thank you all for, for, for good introductions. Uh, if I want to summarize, I mean, non, none of you are alarmists. It looks like, you know, this is going to fare, I mean, <laughs> from what you can expect, it looks like things are going quite well. Uh, the divorce and security do not have very negative implications for European security. But uh, let's put it the other way around. I mean, let's, let's think a little bit worst case scenario, also from Norwegian point of view. Like, you know, what if this goes really bad, a hard Brexit, you know, no snow, like it, hard feelings and all that. What, what, what should we, you know, what should we prepare for if we want to kind of look out for the, for the, you know, worst case scenario? What would be the worst implications of a Brexit when it comes to European security? If, if you may like, you know, again, I know it's speculation, but nonetheless. And then, and then on, on, um, on one question to, to, to Garvin, I mean, you talked about comprehensive approach to, to European security. Um, and, you know, and you talked about lots of non-military tools, as it were. Uh, you didn't really conclude what that means for Brexit. I mean, it seems that these are all EU tools, right? Uh, in other words, you argued for them um, to remain, I guess. <laughs> uh, but uh, could you maybe conclude? I mean, what, what, what does that, if that's what we need to meet the, 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 the security challenges we're facing, how, how, what does, how should that implicate the impact on, on, on Brexit from your point of view? Thank you. Okay, so maybe we should start with Eysten on the, the question from here, and then you could all do the worst case scenario, and then you got the specific question, Garvin. Uh, and thank you for the question, Olguna. That's the kind of question you said. Good question. Next question, please. Uh, it's far beyond my competency to to uh, to. Uh, I've been involved in the in the negotiations of uh, spring spawning herring, spring spawning herring uh, from time to time. But uh, this is a question I I wouldn't be able to answer actually. And I, I do actually have a colleague who specializes in environmental matters and is looking into the um, uh, British position on, on fish post-Brexit. Unfortunately, we don't have work ready um, on that for another, for another few weeks, but it is, it is a very important issue and I'm very glad you raised it. Um, to move on to the worst case scenario, um, um, I'm glad to be described as optimistic about Brexit because normally people think I'm the Nouriel Roubini of Brexit consultants. Um, predicting doom and gloom at all, all possible uh, occasions. And <clears throat> I think the worst case scenario is actually the uh, I, possibility that Britain, Philip Stevens in the Financial Times made reference to it last week, of um, Britain becoming a sort of spoiler country. So you'd have a, a sort of coherent Europe in the middle, and then three spoilers of Russia, Britain, and Turkey on the outside. Um, are doing their best to undermine the unity of the bloc and generally um, cause trouble. In one of the ways that um, suggests that Russian policy is not actually run by a single mastermind Bond villain in the Kremlin, but is a more disordered and op opportunistic um, way, the, um, <coughs> the assassination in Salisbury, um, I think, has made that outcome rather less likely than it would have been, would have been before. The people who would have proposed the um, uh, a kind of spoiler approach would have been people currently on the extreme right wing fringe of the um, Conservative Party. They're unlikely um, 
um, to do that now because the, they are, after all, British nationalists and want to stand up strong against Russia rather than cooperate it, especially after an attack like this. Um, on the implications for Brexit, um, I, th I think the biggest implication of Brexit for European security is the um, putting into question of Britain as a member of, of the Western Alliance, not by Brexit itself, but because of the domestic implications which lead to a significant, the, a significant far left presence in British politics, which there hasn't ever been in foreign policy. Britain has a quite left wing domestic policy before, but even, <coughs> but even the 1945 government, which had very radical domestic policies, uh, was absolutely certain that it was anti-communist and committed to um, NATO and the Western European Union as it was then, and um, the Western Alliance lines broadly. This, uh, the rise of Jeremy Corbyn is a radical change in British left-wing politics. And um, essentially, the, if that happens, the EU will be on its own. It will have to deal with Russia itself. It should not expect um, timely cooperation from the political level of the UK, even though official level relations will continue to be strong. Um, it's a kind of scenario when uh, if Russia um, did something um, that was deniable or associated with one of its salami tactics, um, Britain would be the country that would be then saying, hold on, let's wait for more evidence until, until Russia had succeeded in establishing the fait accompli that was unable to be resolved. Maybe that is the worst case scenario rather than the former one. I don't know. I have nothing to add. Um, I have no further questions on my list at the moment. Uh, it's still open. Um, but I wanted to ask you, because you all mentioned this aspect of Brexit, how Brexit seems to have boosted European cooperation somehow. And Esten, you said the pressure on the brake pedal has eased, you said. Um, I was wondering uh, if I could challenge you to reflect a bit on how persistent or how strong that unity is. Um, in terms of uh, PESCO is just one example of, of how things have been speeding up uh, with the Brexit process, it seems. But what kind of um, dynamics can we envision in, in terms of how, uh, how European security and defence cooperation is going to continue if Britain is in fact sidelined a bit? So uh, will this unity continue to be as strong or could we imagine that there will be maybe camps and clubs of different uh, uh, pressures? Do you have any thoughts on how this will look maybe six, five, six years from now? would like to start now. Yeah, maybe I can take a first stab at that. Um, I, I did mention in my in my opening remarks that, um, that there is a tension between those who uh, would like to see PESCO develop in an inclusive manner, uh, led by Germany, and, and those, uh, on the other hand, that would like to raise the level of ambition, um, mainly spurred by, uh, by, by France. If you, if you look at the 17 projects that have been developed for now uh, and, and the ones that will come online later, then you see the differentiated integration actually at the project level happening um, with only a few member states and, and mainly the southern European uh, member states, Spain and Italy, participating in most uh, of, those, uh, of those projects, uh, 15 to, f to 14 um, projects of the, of the 17 at the moment, whereas the the big member states on which you know the uh, PESCO seems to to rest, the success of PESCO seems to rest, and where everyone looks to as far as the future of the European integration process uh, uh, is concerned, France and Germany, then then you see that they they participate in you know about half of those projects. There may be a result of the, the choice of projects that. Uh, that the EDA has uh, has made at this stage, but it may also be an indicator of um, of the areas in which you know uh, the big member states want to lay their uh, or in which baskets they would like to 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 lay their um, to lay their eggs. Um, I, I would say that there's that there's a risk of uh, of an asymmetrical um, upward convergence that I that I appealed to or th that I alluded to uh, before happening. And thus a, a disjointed um, a single market happening in a clustered form with all kinds of minilaterals uh, happening uh, across Europe. 
um, and and to what extent you know that will be the great harmonizer, um, really, uh, you know, happening over time may you know, remains to be seen. So, if you look at it from from that perspective, then then unity in the implementation of PESCO is actually still far off, um, and would if 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 you'd be a proponent of of that unity, would benefit, of course, from a stronger role. Uh, especially the European Commission, I think, in in laying the the regulatory fabric and and the institutional uh, monitoring and supervision that is necessary in order to keep that uh, that structure and, and the inclusivity uh, as intact as possible. Um, I, I think there's the scope for considerably more um, security policy integration at the level of uh, procurement, research and development, and um even even common training and a certain development of um a, uh, operations and military mobility um then there is at the political level for decisions to take uh take actually take action there are most obviously there's most obviously a division between pe countries focused on the south and the countries focused on the east there are political divisions in countries, and which, and a, con a country's desire to take military action depends heavily on the political complexion of the government in power at the time. Um, on <coughs> with European institutions constructed as they are, it's difficult to see the unified political will existing for significant um, joint operational activity without um, some major crisis, much bigger than anything we've faced recently. And even then, I would be skeptical that the EU would be the vehicle to deal with that. Um, I think that if you, so where, where you want to concentrate at the moment is on capabilities, procurement, and, uh, and, and the rest. So I, I tend to agree with Garvin. I, you know, as I said, uh, a stronger EU, a more un unified EU on defense is, is not bad in itself. It's, it's actually Europe taking more responsibility. Uh, and uh, as Garvin hinted to, we have, uh, as long as you don't end up in kind of a competition between NATO and EU and who does what, and then I think it, that will reinforce each other. And, and as Garvin said, you know, the EU countries all together have 19 different combat vehicles. It's evident that that is not a great way of, of using your resources, while the, the U.S. has too. So, so if you can if you can manage to streamline the EU uh, defense equipment market and the cooperation, that that would be a good thing. But that's of course difficult because you're also speaking about national pride and national interest and national economy. Thank you. We have two more questions, and then I think I'll close the list and give the, uh, you the opportunity to summarize. So the first question over here. Uh, thank you for very interesting presentations. Um, to what extent uh, do you think that uh, the German-French uh, axis could play a constructive role in the future? Um, uh, President Emmanuel Macron uh, held his famous speech uh, at Sorbonne uh, in September, uh, two days after the German elections. And we have now been waiting for a long time for this grand coalition, which was confirmed on the 14th of March. When and how do you think the relationship between uh, France and Germany could develop? Thank you. And then we had a second question from uh, Skagesta over here. Uh, thank you. In your introduction, uh, Mr. Walsh, Dr. Walsh, excuse me, uh, you uh, spoke about the developments taking place in the, the EU about uh, lessening the dependence on Russian gas. I think you expressed yourself in rather optimistic terms. Uh, personally, I think the developments are quite disturbing. When you look at the present construction of the Nord Stream 2, uh, which uh, uh, not only do they have uh, Mr. Schröder as one of the chairmen uh, in Gazprom behind the whole scheme, but um, uh, the Ukrainians, the Eastern Europeans, or the Central Europeans are quite, uh, uh, are quite uh, let's say, upset about what takes place. You mentioned uh, delivery to the continent of Norwegian gas. That might help to some extent. I don't think we should overplay the importance. Uh, if you look to Denmark, they have already passed or uh, they are about to pass a law against uh, 
against letting the Nord Stream 2 pass through their continental shelf. Obviously, there is a great deal of concern about what's uh, taking place here. Uh, so, uh, uh, I, I would just wonder what you base your, let's say, your rosy views upon. Thank you. Okay, so we have one question about the German-French axis and one question about Russian gas. And uh, you can start, Garvin, and uh, and then we will also include your concluding commentaries, I think. I, I'll start, um, and it's great to be accused of optimism twice in one <laughs> um, <laughs> seminar. Uh, the reason for my optimism in, the, in this case has to do with um, <coughs> has to do with the security of supply directive that the EU organized, which requires member states to have um, 90 days um, supply obtainable in their entirety from a second source. And this has led to the creation of um, bi-directional pipelines. And with Lithuania, you have the um, floating LNG terminal, which, yes, could obviously be interdicted by Russian naval action, but there are, there are, steps, being, there are steps being taken. Oh, sorry. Um, as, as so my, the reason for my optimism is the European Security for Supply Directive, which requires member states to ensure that their secondary supply is able to supply 90 days of, um, <coughs> of gas. Um, this has been achieved by bidirectional pipelines, by LNG terminals, in Lithuania's case by a floating LNG terminal. The only country for whom this seemed disproportionate originally was Ireland, which had to build an LNG terminal because it's at the other end of the continent, but um, would otherwise normally re rely on gas from the from the UK. If the Brexit negotiations go really bad, well, you know that may come in handy. Um, but um, this is this has been so. This allows Russia to spend a lot of money constructing Nord Stream Two, but because of the just the territorial contiguity uh, contiguity of um, the European continent. Um, it's cheaper to um, subvert the Russian attempts by making sure gas can flow the other way. This can be complemented by um, this can be co complemented by um, uh, looking at things like a trans-European supply grid that links northern wind-based renewables with southern um, sun-based sun renewables um, across the continent. That is being proposed. One area of concern I would point out is the uh, surprisingly strong presence of um, anti-fracking environmental groups in certain Eastern European countries. Um, and it would be very surprising to me if there has been no Russian influence in helping those environmental groups reach their current um, sta state of strength. Um, and um, I won't particularly comment on the Franco-German axis. I'll leave that to other people so that you don't hear it even more of my voice. Um, but thank, thank you very much. I think these are um, interesting, um, very interesting political times for Europe and Britain. Um, I will just leave you with the um, uh, thought that it's not business as usual in the UK. Uh, we've been used to this country being a provider of stability and certainty. And now it isn't. It's divided. Its politics are volatile. Um, its economic outlook is very much dependent on on its politics and its political alignment is uh, within the Western Alliance system is dependent on it, on its politics. So prepare for a bumpy ride ahead. Thank you. I'll, I think we do Brussels and then Oslo, right? <laughs> yes. Um, well, on, on the Franco-German uh, axis in, uh, in in the future of Europe uh, or EU uh, reform. A lot of political hay is being made of of that axis, but not only do I think there is um, uh, there's potential for friction in the bilateral context between a flamboyant, you know, ideas spouting, hyperactive French president, um, without in some cases, you know, concrete substance to some of the plans floated, and I mentioned the European uh, intervention initiative. Um, but also on, uh, on on the reform of the eurozone, you know, th there's there's clear differences with the more technocratic approach, administrative approach by um, by by the German government, which of course has been weakened uh, as a, as a grand coalition. I think that that's that's one side why or one argument why we shouldn't probably expect too much of um, a Franco-German axis really driving. Europe, uh, European reform, uh, fast forward. 
The second is that um, there are all kinds of, of mid-sized countries that will simply not accept um, a diktat from, uh, from Berlin and Paris, uh, and that are, are being exposed now as a result of, uh, of Brexit. Uh, the, the Netherlands um, uh, Prime Minister Rutte in Berlin gave a speech unhelpfully after, just after the Mansion House speech uh, by Theresa May, so it got a bit eclipsed. But the point there um, well, was exactly to show that the Netherlands, as um, as guiding country of uh, of the of the mid-sized member states, supported by the likes of Sweden and and other Nordic uh, countries, has different views about you know where the European integration process uh, should be should be headed, and. I don't think we can we can just you know not take them for granted uh, in in that discussion which uh, which will come up especially if um, there's there's sand in the wheels between Paris and uh, and Berlin. Thank you, and that is then you will have the opportunity. To I don't know whether I would have any any enlightening final comments, but to my mind, uh, and as I said, you know, the most important thing is to find solutions that avoid new dividing lines in Europe. And the question mentioned uh, the worst case scenario. In any scenario, we would still have our EEA relationship to the EU. So we would kind of continue with that relationship to the EU. We would probably have a good bilateral relationship to the UK. But, you know, if, as Garvin said, the UK would end up as a spoiler, that, that, would, be, uh, that would create some dividing lines that, that would be in, in no one's interest. So I, looking at the kind of constructive approach that is now taken, looking at Donald Tusk's uh, statement last week, I believe that this will find a solution that, given the scenario, given the, the, uh, the situation, would be the best possible. Thank you all, three of you, for, for very good uh, both introduction and also answers here today on, on quite complicated questions, I would say. Uh, I would also like to, to thank you all for coming on a Friday afternoon to, to NUPI to, to listen to, to uh, a presentation of things that are, are really important and really interesting. Uh, we have more seminars coming up at NUPI. Please check our website to, to pay attention to what we are doing here. You can also re-watch this seminar, if you like, on our YouTube channel. Uh, and also other seminars are streamed, most of the time we do. Uh, thank you, and uh, have a good weekend, all of you. <laughs>